please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. You should already be there from the scripture reading. And our text is verses 8 through 10. I'll read those again. The title is Christ Our Sabbath. Follow along as I read Hebrews 4, 8 through 10. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. I remember oh so well growing up as a, as a Jewish boy in New York City. I must have attended hundreds of services in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Most of the time when the family would go during a Jewish holiday, we would go on Saturday about 10 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock sometimes later, depending on the holiday. And I remember so much about those Sabbath services, the singing, I, to this day, 62 years old, I can still sing in the Hebrew those old songs that we sang in the synagogue. And I'm not going to sing those songs now, don't worry. <laughs> but I can sing them. I, I do remember them. And I remember vividly and graphically so many of the exercises and activities of the service, uh, the standing up, the sitting down, the responsive reading between the rabbi and the audience. The rabbi would read a verse in Hebrew, and the audience would respond by reading the next verse in Hebrew. And so much of what took place, the, the facial features of the men, their mannerisms and body language as they prayed and as they went through their davening, and as you went into the foyer of the synagogue, there was a wooden box, and it was filled with yarmulkes, about a hundred yarmulkes in there. And all the men who went into the synagogue would take one and put it on. The real holy Jewish men, or at least in their own estimation of holiness, the real faithful Jewish men, they had their own little velvety yarmulkes with gold trim in the middle. And then someone had, would have special made prayer shawls that you put around your shoulders and they hung down to about the knees or a little lower and they were frayed on the edges. And I can remember so many details about the synagogue worship services growing up. But the one thing I never received, I never had, during those services or growing up as a boy in the Jewish religion, was peace and rest. On those Sabbath day services, I came away with emptiness inside. No peace, no rest. And so today I want to talk about Christ, our Sabbath rest. And in doing so, I do so from a, from a very unique perspective, representing four or five thousand years of Jewish history, where for most of that time, though Christ was taught and preached through by the prophets and the priests and the, the Levites and the leaders, the rabbis, um, the Jewish religion was taught, but the Christ of Judaism, the Christ of the Old Testament, was very, very seldom presented to the congregation. And very seldom as well did most of the congregation know him, although the fourth commandment itself, the Sabbath, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. But most of the Jews never knew that. They never found peace and rest through all the types and figures of Christ that was presented in the tabernacle, through the furniture of the temple, and all of the allegorical um, things that could have prompted uh, them going down a road in which they would find Christ. They never did. They never did. This is a very powerful text, and I'm going to be hard-pressed to keep it to one message. I hope I can. But I've been in the school in which I've been trying to learn that each text does not have to be expounded upon exhaustively upon exhaustion. 
So, <clears throat> by way of re review, you remember the original audience of the book of Hebrews were Jewish Christians who were in danger of returning to Judaism in order to become accepted by their families and avoid persecution from the Romans. God urges them to remember the superiority of Christ and what they would lose by turning back to Judaism. They would lose Christ and everything he represents and everything that we have in him. They would give that up if they turned back. The warning passages of the book of Hebrews provide both caution and encouragement for all Christians, therefore, to persevere in the faith. For Hebrews was written to us as well as to them. The second warning passage, which we've been studying in chapter 3, verse 7, through chapter 4, and verse 13, quotes Psalm 95 twice in chapter 3 and three times in chapter 4, in verse 3, 5, and 7, warning readers not to fall short of entering God's rest. Psalm 95, verses 5 through 11, is quoted five times in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4 for a reason. And in the Old Testament, God warned the Jews through not Psalm 95 not to harden their hearts against God, not to allow faith and obedience to diminish, but to remain high and active. And he also does the same thing for us in the New Testament. We who profess to be Christians are warned not to fall short of entering God's rest. Though we've heard the gospel and all of us have started out well, we're here, we're at worship together, we profess to be Christians still, we have not denied the Lord Jesus Christ by His grace, we're seeking to persevere, we're still in the faith to this moment, we've started out well, but we must continue persevering in the Christian faith until the very last breath we breathe. Now the major theme of Hebrews, there's several, but the major one is the superiority of Christ. In chapter 1, we saw Christ is superior to the prophets in verses 1 through 3. Chapters 1 and 2, he is superior to angels. Chapters 2 and 3, to Moses. And in chapters 3 and 4, we see that Christ is greater or superior to Joshua. Though we haven't heard the name Joshua until now. In verse 8. In verses 1 through 7, we learn that only those who believe enter God's rest. You may say you're a Christian, you may profess faith in Christ, but unless you actually exercise saving faith and ongoing faith, you cannot be saved. Faith is a sign of true believers. Disobedience shows a lack of faith and hinders us in entering God's rest. Now the Sabbath rest of the believer begins at conversion when we find peace with God. We rest our all in Christ, we're forgiven of our sins, and we give Him our life, and we truly find rest in Christ for the first time. That begins at conversion, and our rest continues throughout our lives. We continually find rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we not? Mm -hmm. And continues even furthermore in heaven forever. We truly have found a resting place at conversion throughout our lives in this world and forevermore when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. A permanent resting place. There's no other vacation, no other resting place but in the Lord Jesus Christ for us. We've arrived at our destination when we put our faith in Christ. Now, persevering faith is the key element that drives our rest in Christ, that conversion and in this life. We must keep exercising faith, a faith that perseveres, a faith that though may go astray, keeps coming back to the Lord Jesus Christ and reigniting itself by faith in Him. Persevering faith is such that when it diminishes, when it grows weary and goes astray, 
It always perseveres and comes back to Christ and exercises faith in Him for the restoration and recovery of our souls in persevering in the faith. Have you ever taken the temperature of your faith? Have you taken it lately? Are you, is your faith lukewarm? Is it complacent? Is it stagnant? Or is it active? Have you exercised faith in Christ today as a believer? And is your faith growing? Are you stimulating your faith by the word of God and prayer? Because faith must be growing. It must push. It must press into the kingdom of God. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. Violent faith. Radical faith. That does not take no for an answer. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. With fear and trembling, keep returning to Christ. And as ashamed and guilty as we feel, let the eye of faith look up once again to Christ and behold Him who prays for you. Behold Him who sympathizes with you. Behold Him who by faith will restore you. He said, did He not do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life? Strive, strive to enter in through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, seek to enter and will not be able. And some of them, I, I doubt not, won't be able to enter into through the narrow gate because faith died. They did not continue to persevere in exercising faith upon the object of our rest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is your faith, my beloved? Where is your faith today? Have you taken its temperature? By way of introduction, dreams of utopia have appealed to human minds for millennia. A whole political system is built on it. Communism, socialism. When Sir Thomas More in 1516 wrote the book Utopia, he chose the name because in Greek it means no place. Many attempts have been made in history to find or create such a place where life approaches perfection, nirvana, Shangri-La, but none has succeeded. Yet the dream has not faded, probably because it represents a distant memory of something we once had and still yearn for a greater Sabbath, a, a better place than this world with all of its suffering and struggles. On the seventh day of creation, and by the way, the word Sabbath in Hebrew means seven, God was said to have rested from all his work in Genesis 2.2. We've already seen in our study of Hebrews that this was not total inactivity. God didn't stop working because God has been active throughout all history. He upholds the, the world by the word of his power. It's probably best described as a rest of a perfectly functioning creation. As a mechanic rests from his work when his machine runs perfectly. Mankind dreamed that utopia would be properly a properly functioning society. But there is no such thing. You and I will never find a utopia in this world because sin has ruined and marred God's original creation. This physical world will never be. We are not progressing towards utopia in this world because sin has permanently marred this world. The earth groans and travails, does it not? looking for and hastening to that day when the Lord Jesus Christ will destroy the old heavens and the old earth and will create a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So if there ever will be a place called Utopia or Nirvana or Shangri-La, that will be it when we will go to be with the Lord in heaven and He will glorify us as his people, and he will recreate the heavens and the earth to 
be a place of perfection. Never again to be marred or stained by sin. So the, the rest that people strive for is to be found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Though if you don't know Christ today, there is still rest to be found. Though you may be weary, there is rest for your never dying soul. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is on his throne, waiting, listening for sinners, calling upon him. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he will give you his Sabbath rest. He will give you his peace, which is salvation. Which brings me to our first point. Number one, Joshua and the Sabbath rest. Verse 8. Hebrews 4 and verse 8. For if Joshua, ah, there he is, the elusive Joshua. We've already been talking about him by way of implication in the context. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There are so many Bible students and theologians that believe, especially Jewish theologians, that Joshua gave the people of God, the Jewish people, rest. He brought them, he led them into the promised land. There is no more any rest for the Jewish people or for the professing people of God because Joshua already led them from the wilderness into the promised land. But is this the rest that God talks about here in Joshua? I mean, in Hebrews 4, regarding Joshua? You know, Joshua's very name means salvation. Jehovah is salvation. Yeshua in the Hebrew. It's the same exact name as Jesus. And Joshua here is mentioned by name. He is indeed a type of Christ in the Old Testament, but his greatness is not being compared to Christ's greatness here. Because Joshua's work in leading Israel into the Promised Land was but a symbol and greatly inferior to the work of Jesus Christ, who is the substance. Joshua is the shadow the type, and Jesus is the substance, the fulfillment. Joshua led the Jews physically into their rest. Yes, we agree with our Jewish friends in that point, but Jesus actually provides spiritual rest and peace by being our suffering substitute on the cross, who, at, as the sacrifice for sin, actually purchased our eternal rest and redemption by his once for all sacrifice. Jesus Christ provides eternal spiritual rest to all who believe in him. He provides rests from those who are trying to earn their way to heaven by their good deeds and their works, which they will never ever do. God will never bear peace, bear, bear witness in their conscience. Peace and forgiveness by works, by the works of our hands. We will never earn the witness and testimony of God's acceptance and peace and forgiveness. Only the Lord Jesus Christ gives us this spiritual rest from our works, rest from the torment of guilt, rest from the burden of sin that we all carry all of our lives until we are given this rest this freedom, this emancipation from the guilt and penalty of sin provided who? By who? By the Lord Jesus Christ, our great King, our Redeemer, the one who is our heavenly Joshua leading us into his promised land. So I ask you, where is your rest? What do you build your hope upon? What is the foundation of your rest. Is it in this world or is it with Jesus in heaven? Are you putting all your eggs in the basket of this world, all your hopes and dreams in the things of this life? Or have you sacrificed and, uh, and forsaken everything of self and of the world and given your entire life with your hopes and dreams and goals and ambitions in the hopes and by faith that you will rest forever with Jesus Christ in heaven. I pray it's the latter. We think of those who all died in faith. 
described in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 and following, they died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But their minds and their hopes were not on that homeland. It was not on Egypt. For true believers who find rest in Christ, they seek another country. They desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them in another country, in another world. He's prepared a mansion, a city, a place, a table for His people to come and partake with God at that supper and then enter into the joy of the Lord, enter into their eternal rest where they will cease from striving, cease from trouble and suffering and pain and bills and persecution. For if you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your bill is paid in full. Your sin debt is canceled. And your sins and iniquities he will remember no more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the Lord Jesus Christ that is presented to us from Hebrews chapter 4. He is our Joshua who leads us. You must follow him. You must follow him into the promised land. No, it's not. There's no time during the service Well, I will say, all rise and we walk out the door and follow some apparition to some geographical location. No, no. You must follow our heavenly Joshua, Jesus, by faith putting your trust in Him to fulfill His promises either to save you if you're not converted or if you are, to keep you and to keep stimulating and quickening your faith though it grow weak and weary day by day, to rejuvenate it by looking to Him and trusting in Him, however small your faith may be. Put your trust in Him because Faith in Christ will bring down your portion of grace and strength you need to, to rejuvenate your faith for another day, to press on and be faithful and look to Christ and follow Him even for one more day on the path, on the narrow way that leads to life. Moses is indeed an example of one who put his trust in Christ he told the Jewish people that there is one coming that's greater than him. And when he comes, follow him. He was not talking about his servant Joshua. He was talking about his Lord, Jesus Christ. When he comes, follow him, hear him. He has come 2,000 years ago. Are we doing that? Are we following Christ? Moses was praying to God, a troubled Moses who came before God often, pouring out his heart and burdens to the Lord in prayer because of the stiff-necked, stiff stubborn Jewish people who would not listen to him, who rejected the word of God over and over and over again. They would not obey the Lord, and they would not put their trust in the Lord. They so easily turned aside to idols. How much have we learned about their their sin of idolatry that they made into a science in our study in the book of Hosea. But in looking at Moses, this man of God in the Bible, representing all the prophets, Moses and Elijah representing the prophets, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, we read of Moses. These all, or we read of, uh, I'm sorry, in Exodus chapter 33. Turn there to Exodus chapter 33. Beginning at verse 12, Exodus 33 and 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your way 
that I may know you, and that I might find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Moses is an example of someone as great as he was, who was simply seeking God's rest, his peace, because he wanted to know God more deeply in his life. And peace and rest are but fruits of the Spirit. They're fruits and evidences of our heart relationship with the Lord. And God knew what Moses was praying. He was praying about his frustrations with the Jewish people. He was praying for them that God would forgive them and be patient with them. And he was praying in that light concerning his ministry that it would be successful in the people of God, the Jewish people, following the Lord and obeying the Lord. But there was another aspect about Moses' prayer. And that is there was an individual request and he said in verse 13, that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. There was a point in Moses' prayer that he left his brethren behind. He left the entire nation and the concerns and the issues behind. And he was just praying to God individually. It was Moses and God that he wanted to know him. And God says in verse 14, and he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. I know Moses in your heart of hearts. I know you. I made you. I made your body. I created your spirit. And I know that deep, deep down inside, you just want rest with me, with God. We all want rest. And as a believer, we all have ultimately the same essential need to have rest and, rest and peace with the Lord. In Hebrews 11, we read again of Moses. In verse 24, it says, By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Again, we have a text that transitions from Moses and his ministry, his education, his learning, into Moses, the individual believer, not wanting anything of this world esteeming the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. A Moses who looked past all the persecution and the pain and the struggle to his eternal rest in heaven with God. And so, in essence, that is the heart of the Sabbath rest. What is the meaning of the Sabbath rest? The meaning of it is peace and rest in the Lord Jesus Christ between you and Him. We're all seeking peace and rest. We all want those tokens and witnesses of God's assuring grace and mercy and acceptance and witness with our spirit that we know Him. We're His children. We want His peace. We want tokens of His rest as much as we can get. Because deep down inside, God created us there's a vacuum inside that needs constant filling for a need of his peace. The fact that God repeats his promise of rest through King David the psalmist in Psalm 95, he repeats this a number of times in Hebrews 3 and 4. Look up the word rest in your concordances and in your lexicon. It is found more in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 than anywhere else in the Bible. It's extremely concentrated. The word rest in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, referring to Jesus Christ as our rest. And so, like I said, God repeats this promise of his rest in Psalm 95, in Hebrews 3 and 4. 
And in Psalm 95, when David wrote about God's rest, it was centuries after Israel had entered Canaan. They had already entered that physical geographical location, which was identified as the promised land or a place of rest. And so when in Psalm 95, hundreds of years later, if the Jews were already in Canaan, God brings up this issue of rest again through the psalmist. If that physical location in Israel, in the land of Canaan, was intended to be the permanent place of rest for the people of God, why does he bring it up again in Psalm 95 and say, no, there remains a rest for the people of God. And so Canaan shows that or it shows this, this Canaan rest is not the permanent place of rest. It's a shadow. But the Sabbath rest, whatever that means, is the substance. There was the physical land of Canaan and Israel where the Jews escaped from armed invasion and natural disasters and the failure of their crops when they were faithful to God. But at its best, that Canaan, that land of Canaan, that outward rest was simply that, was outward and essentially physical and could not satisfy the promise of rest to people struggling with the burden of sin. This spiritual rest in Christ alone was intended from the beginning to be the place of rest. God specifically stated, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. That's what it means in the original. And the first promise of spiritual rest was given by God in Genesis 3.15. After Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, God came and said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Eventually, Satan would be crushed, would be defeated. The victory would be obtained by Christ, and the rest and the peace that Christ purchased for us on the cross <clears throat> would be given to his people, would be given to believers, who are you and me. Number two, <clears throat> Christ and the Sabbath rest. So in the first place, we see that this rest that Joshua brought the people of God, the Jewish people, into the land of Canaan. That rest was a spiritual rest. It was typical and allegorical of our rest in the Lord Jesus Christ, our salvation in and of Him. <clears throat> Secondly, Christ and the Sabbath rest. We read in verse 9, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Look at the words, there remains. I've just explained what that means. But I'll repeat it. It means that the Sabbath rest wasn't fulfilled in the creation ordinance of rest. When God created the earth in six days and he rested on the seventh day. Remember, Sabbath means seven. He rested on that Sabbath day, that seventh day. That was not the Sabbath rest that God was ultimately referring to. Nor was it fulfilled in the fourth commandment in Exodus 20 when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and he gave the tablets of stone containing the Ten Commandments. The fourth commandment is what? Remember the what? Sabbath day to keep it holy. That, uh, that Sabbath rest that God speaks of here in Hebrews 4.9 was not fulfilled then when God commanded the Jews in the Decalogue, in the, in the tablets of stone, to keep this 24-hour period in a way where you do not do any physical work. So our spiritual rest was not fulfilled in the fourth commandment, nor was it fulfilled when Joshua led the Jews into the promised land. The physical land of Canaan is not the fulfillment of the spiritual promise of rest to his people. But like I said, because it says here, there still remains a rest to be fulfilled in Hebrews 4 and verse 9. And what is that rest? And how is it fulfilled? It is a spiritual rest, as I said. And one experience, 
And one experiences this rest when he or she trusts in Jesus Christ unto the saving of his or her soul. That's what the Sabbath rest means. And that is the fulfillment of the Sabbath, Sabbath rest. When you and I got saved, God fulfilled his promise to all believers to bring us into the promised land. What is the promised land? The Lord Jesus Christ, He is our final resting place from all of our spiritual enemies, including sin, the world, and the devil. We find rest in Him, do we not? Though, though the world around us is falling down, everything is chaos, yes, the Holy Spirit provides rest and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ in, in our hearts, in our consciences. So it's Christ himself who is our rest. And does not the Lord Jesus himself say as much in Matthew 11, verse 28, when he says, come to me? He's saying, come to your Sabbath rest. When you come to Christ, you come to your final resting place. All you who labor and are heavy laden, go to your Sabbath rest, the Lord Jesus Christ. For he says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he promises to give you rest. So therefore, everything that we can describe and define that is rest, we experience that spiritually when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. When he pours out his peace into our hearts. Do we not experience this peace of God which passes all understanding? This sense that the Spirit of God gives us that all is well with our soul, that our sins are forgiven, that there is therefore now no condemnation in my heart because I am in Christ Jesus? Does he remove everything from our inner man that is connected with strife and weariness and guilt and struggle and replace it with his peace and calmness of soul. It is the difference between Peter stepping out of the boat into turbulent waters and the Lord Jesus Christ saying, peace be still, peace be still. Oh, when we lack Jesus as our rest, our Sabbath rest, we're like Peter stepping outside the boat. Everything around us causes us violent disturbances in our soul. But when we take our eyes off of those circumstances, those problems, those issues, and we look past them to Jesus Christ, our peace, our Sabbath rest, we trust in Him to come afresh and dispense that grace peace, that rest peace in our hearts. Our whole inside world and our spiritual being calms down. He is our Sabbath rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He teaches us afresh by pouring out his spirit who declares to our hearts the attributes and perfections of Christ to our soul. We're reminded of his meekness. His forgiveness, His patience, His love, His forbearance. We're reminded of how, how precious He is as our high priest, as our intercessor, as our mediator. We're reminded that He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. We're reminded in our minds and hearts of the loveliness of Christ, who Himself has endured with us all this time and is still showing grace and love and mercy to us. That's what it means to learn of Him. The Holy Spirit teaches us, reminds us afresh of the greatness and the glory of Jesus as our shepherd, as a gentle, kind, compassionate shepherd to us. And those precious attributes are poured out mysteriously and uh, omnipotently into our hearts and everything calms down within us. Okay. God sets forth a promise of rest to us in the Bible. He says in Isaiah 28, 12, 
He's speaking to the Jews in the historical context. And he says, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. The Jews would not hear. God is preaching to them about his rest in Christ and this refreshing. But the word of the Lord was to them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. The problem was, is the word of God was being proclaimed to them, but they were not entering into the rest that the words and promises of God guaranteed and proclaimed. They were hearing the word. They were hearing precept upon precept. The Levites and the priests were teaching line upon line, here a little, there a little. But they did not exercise faith that they might enter into their rest as the people of God. And that's our problem. Christ is our rest. We know Him. We're His people. But we must exercise ongoing faith that we might perpetually, frequently, regularly enter into our Sabbath rest where works cease. And every activity is stilled all around us and we just bask and rest in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We trust in Him alone. We look to Him alone. We rest all of our care and our needs in Him alone. And He dispenses from there that sense of His peace and His rest, His acceptance. He calms us down in our souls and reminds us as only He can of His love and His grace and mercy. Don't you just want to praise Him? Amen. And so we have to look past the words and the teachings, even the ones I'm giving you now from Hebrews 4. If you would enter your rest afresh, if you would be refreshed as Isaiah promised the Jewish people in Isaiah 28, 12, to look past the words Believe them, understand the words, but in the end look past the words to the person of Christ and exercise faith in Him. Look past the words and the teachings and the orthodoxy and the ceremonies to Christ Himself and trust in Him and have direct dealings with Him. Jesus said as much to the Pharisees. They were experts in the letter of the law. But he said to them, Jesus said to them in John 5, 38, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. They had, they had the word, but then they didn't have the word. He said, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. They did that all day long. They were professional students of the Bible. But they didn't abide in the word. That, in other words, they didn't believe the word. Hmm. Ultimately, the word that is preached, it did not profit them not being mixed with faith. Faith. Faith in our Sabbath rest. So when we hear the word of God, it's good to come prepared and ready to hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let him hear according to the method that God, the Holy Spirit, provides. But we must, when we hear, exercise faith in Christ. Exercise faith in the one who is the living word. And have direct dealings with him. Jesus told the Pharisees, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me, of him. Somewhere along the line, the precept, the line, the letter of the law, must direct your heart to exercise faith in Christ, asking Him and believing Him for those things which the Holy Spirit brings up during the teaching and the preaching that you need, that He shows you you need. You don't, we don't sit there and let the Word just bounce off of us like mutes. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. We go out to God with our hearts and believe in the one who gave us the word. We're not Pharisees 
who take our Bibles and put it on an altar and bow down to the letter of the law, worshiping the ink on paper because we're the chosen chosen caretakers of the Word of God and we're special because God gave us the Bible? Well, what good is it being special as caretakers of the oracles of God if you don't believe the Word and you don't know Him who gave the Word and you don't trust Him and believe in Him who gave the Word? Christ is a rest. He's a type of rest so that you know you're hearing the Word of God properly. You know you're assimilating the Word of God properly in your individual Bible study or in this art of properly hearing the Word of God when it's preached and taught and expounded. When somewhere along the line, as you exercise faith in Christ, you experience a rest in your heart. <laughs> because rest from God comes from faith in Christ. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Jeremiah 6, it says, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your soul. The old paths, the old ways, where the word of God is preached and believed. Continuing in verse 9, it says, therefore, there remains therefore. The word therefore sums up what has been said by pointing to the rest that remains, which is Jesus Christ. He says, therefore, there's a rest. Now, this term is very important as I hurry on. This term in the original is sabbatismos. I very, very rarely quote Greek and Hebrew words. I could all the time. I could, like Dr. Downing, I can quote 20, 30 a sermon. And for him, that's good. That's good. But I'm quoting it this time because it's the only time in the Bible where this word is found. And it means Sabbath rest. So in the original, it should say, therefore, or there remains, therefore, a sabbatismos, or a Sabbath rest. It doesn't just say rest. It means Sabbath rest in the original. It suggests that the seventh-day Sabbath was given to Israel only as a shadow. But the Sabbath rest mentioned here, the sabbatismos mentioned here, is the true rest found in Christ. And Paul very precisely describes this Sabbatismos, this Sabbath rest, in Colossians 2, 16 through 18. I want you to turn there. Very critical point. Colossians 2, verse 16. We have such a precise and articulate description of Christ as our Sabbath rest in Colossians 2, 16 through 17. We'll just stick with 16 and 17. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So God takes the entirety of the whole Old Testament the ceremonial law as represented by the food and drink offerings. There were not only animal sacrifices, but there were food and drink offerings, right? There were three annual festivals. There were new moons that need to be observed. There were special Sabbaths, not just the seventh-day Sabbath. There was the seventh-day Sabbath once a week from Friday at 6 p.m. to Saturday at 6 p.m. But then there was Sabbaths related that were to be observed, special Sabbaths during new moons. There was a Jubilee Sabbath, a special Sabbath for every 50 years for the Jubilee. And there were special Sabbaths related to the festivals. It wasn't just the laborious once a week, 52 Sabbaths a year. There were many, many other Sabbaths that the Jews had to keep in connection with 
various other aspects of the ceremonial law. But the Lord in Colossians 2, 16 summarizes the entire ceremonial law. And he says that nobody can judge you any longer if you don't keep kosher. If you don't follow the dietary laws of the Old Testament, the Mosaic law, dietary laws, the festivals, we're all in big trouble because none of us in here go to Jerusalem three times a year to observe the various festivals. And the new moons and the Sabbaths, not just Sabbath singulars, but Sabbaths plural, which includes all of the different kinds of Sabbaths. Now, these four aspects of the ceremonial law represent the entirety of the ceremonial law. He says, the ceremonial law is just a shadow. All of it's a shadow. It is not the permanent goal for the people of God. The shadows are never the ultimate purpose of God. They are just hints of what is to come in the future. They are hints of the true rest that we find in the substance, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says that the substance is of Christ. And so here in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, he lumps the religious festivals, the new moon celebrations, the Sabbath days together as a shadow of things that were to come. The reality behind the shadow, however, is found in Christ, which not only describes salvation, but also the process by which we will continue to work and live, namely dependence on God, uh, to be at work in us and through us. It is For it is God who works in us to will and to do according to His good pleasure. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is our Sabbath rest. Everything else before, as described in the Old Testament Levitical law, the entire Old Testament economy, it's the Levitical systems of the priesthood and the, the offerings, that whole system. Christ is the fulfillment of it all. And all the ordinances and all of the types and shadows and figures that those Old Testament ordinances represented or were represented in them, were fulfilled by Christ. And now in the New Testament, there's only one permanent ceremonial law. And we observe that ceremonial, that ceremony, three times a month here at Christ Bible Church. It's called the Lord's Supper. And as the Old Testament was a shadow of the substance which is found in Christ, now that we have the substance, we only need one ceremonial law, right? Because we have the substance. Why are we going to go back to the shadows? And this is what the apostle is saying to the Hebrew Christians. Is why do you want to go back? Why do you want to go back to your family? Renounce Christ. Go back to Judaism. Can you imagine here I am, a Christian 42 years. A pastor 34 years. Why do I want to go back to my mother and say, Mom, I'm Jewish again. Let's go to the synagogue. Hundreds of Sabbath day services as a boy. I told you when we first started. No peace, no joy, nothing. All I have is a memory of, sit down, stand up, the yarmulke, the talus, take off, put on, nothing, empty inside. Why do I want to go back to that? There's no substance. It's a shadow of empty things. I have Christ now. Hallelujah. And as a Christian, you have Christ. Don't think about going back. Because there's nothing there but a dead end road to hell. False promises leading you nowhere. You have Christ. You have arrived at your final destination. He is our rest. We can enjoy Him forever, beginning when you became a Christian. Today you can enjoy Him because He has given you Himself. And all that He is and all that He has are ours. He is our inheritance. <laughs> what joy! Hallelujah. What joy there is to know that Christ is ours and we have arrived at our rest and we have our inheritance. And the last thing, very quickly, verse 10, works and the Sabbath rest. Number three, works and the Sabbath rest. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. 
you would think that verse 10 would be before verse 9, but it's not. And so verse 10, where the aspect of works comes after and is dealt with after the matter of peace and the matter of rest. Now the key to understanding how Jesus is our Sabbath rest is the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means to rest or stop or cease from work. There's, a, there's one meaning that is seven, but there's also another meaning to Sabbath, which is to stop working. This is important in understanding the Old Testament day, the Sabbath day, and the role of Christ as our Sabbath rest, and the relationship between the Old Testament Sabbath and the Lord Jesus as our Sabbath. Now in verse 10, we learn the nature of that rest. It means to cease from one's own work, and so by implication, to trust in the work of Christ instead. Nobody ever got saved, ever, if that person did not stop working. There must be the complete cessation of working even in your thoughts and motives in thinking that by doing some kind of physical work or activity that you are earning favor or some merit with God. There must be none of that in your efforts or in your mind before God will hear you. There must be the complete ceasing of working in your intentions and in obtaining salvation. We read in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9. Many of you can stand up right now and quote it by heart. For by grace you are saved, through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. So God says twice that it's not of works. He says not of yourselves. Anything you do, anything of yourself, your merit, your resume, your credentials, your works, your personality, nothing of yourself, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There must be the emptiness of any smattering and anything that smacks of works in your thoughts, in your mind, in your intentions, in your motives when you approach God. Salvation must be a gift. It must be a one-way gift. A gift means what? It means it's a gift. You can't buy a gift, can you? You can only receive it for free. I tell the story once in a while of my son, Joey. He's a little boy. And Christmas time comes. The night before Christmas, I call Joey into the room and say, Joey, now, you've been a naughty boy all year long. I just want to let you know now so you're not disappointed tomorrow that when you wake up and you, and you run to the Christmas tree and your other four brothers are opening their presents, there's not going to be any there for you because you didn't do very well this year, Joey. You're a naughty boy. And he, okay, Daddy, and walks away with his head hung. The next morning, the boys wake up, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, whatever it is. We hear noise in the background. They run, they're excited, the paper is flying, the boxes, you can hear cardboard crumpling, Joey is just in his room, sad. But slowly he makes his way to the living room. He peeks around the corner and he sees his brothers enjoying the toys and the Christmas gifts and they're excited. But he looked and he saw that under the tree there were three presents unopened. <laughs> he, wait a minute, and he looked over there and he, and he walked to the tree and he saw his name was on those three presents. Dad made a mistake. He told me last night I wasn't getting anything. So he comes to the room, bangs, jumps on the bed. Dad, Dad, you, you made a mistake that there's three presents under the tree that have my name written on the label. I said, come here, Joey. Come here. Sit next to me. Put my arm around me. Joey, I did this deliberately to teach you a lesson. Though you've been a, boy, a bad boy all your life, you don't deserve to get any gifts. 
but I'm giving them to you anyway, even though you don't deserve them. Really? And they went off and opened the gifts. That's salvation. We've been bad all of our life, haven't we? And I mean really bad. I mean really, really bad. We were all very, very naughty. Uh-uh-uh. We've sinned against the holy God who did nothing but pour out gifts and grace and things. And therefore, when we get saved, it's not of works. It's a gift. He just gives it to us. We can't earn it. We can't work for it. We can't swim an ocean, climb a mountain. We can't work 100 hours a week for it. We just stop working. And we get all thoughts of self, righteousness, and self-importance, and how good we are, and replace it with unworthiness. We deserve hell. We deserve damnation. Our sins have condemned us. And we just trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save our soul. We believe that He did the work, the only work that God would accept unto the saving of our soul. His suffering and death on the cross in our place. And the righteousness and the merit inherent and involved in Christ's atoning death is transferred to me. The righteousness of Christ is imputed and credited to my account. And that's how I get saved. That's how I am justified. That's how I am accepted in the blood. I come not with nothing in my hands I bring simply to your cross I claim. And the only thing I have that's pleasing to God is what Christ gave me in the form of his righteousness. He sees nothing good in me, but he sees Christ's righteousness. That I'm clothed in it. And that is the grounds and the basis of my acceptance with God. And he gives it all to me as a gift. Freely. Can you imagine that? For free, Brother Will. Completely and absolutely for free. Praise God. So when we talk about the Sabbath rest, it was God who gave the promised land to the Jews. It was God who fought their battles for them. It was God, although he chastised, chastised them painfully in the wilderness for 40 years. It was God who brought them in. It was God who did all the work and led them into the promised land. He raised up a Moses and sent, them, sent Moses to Egypt. And he, through Moses, brought them into the promised land. God did all the miracles, the 10 amazing miracles. And God preserved them by miracle day and night for the 40 years. And then God raised up Joshua. And through Joshua, God brought them into the promised land. It was all God doing the work, leading them into their promised land, their Sabbath rest. And the same is true with salvation. Our Joshua that saves our soul is Yeshua HaMashiach. English translation, Jesus the Messiah. He did all the work completely and utterly and absolutely to save my soul. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. What a gift. What a miracle of grace. One of the vital truths of Christianity is that in serving God, we seek His power and don't rely on our own works, even as Christians. We ask God to work in and through us to accomplish His will. This is the key to the Apostle's labors. He says, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. He also says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Notice He said, I no longer live. I no longer live. As a Christian, Christ is my Sabbath rest. And I no longer work, even as a Christian. Yes, I do good works and I do labors. He's commanded us. But always crediting Christ. Always acknowledging Christ. Always looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. The source of my strength, my labors, my fruitfulness. As a Christian, I no longer live. That is, I do not look for any achievement by my own efforts. Rather, Christ lives in me in the life 
that I live and the things that I do are by faith in Jesus Christ. That is, they are done in dependence upon the Son of God to work in and through me, as unworthy as I am, as unworthy as I am. This makes clear that truly keeping the Sabbath is not observing a special day. That special day, that Old Testament Sabbath is but the sh shadow of the real Sabbath, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Sabbath is Him. We rest in Him. You need to do more work for the Lord. Go to Christ. Rest in Him. Ask Him for an open door. But Sabbath keeping is achieved when the heart rests on the great promise of God to be working through a believer in the normal affairs of living. We disagree with our Sabbatarian brethren. We disagree with the Seventh-day Adventists. Strongly disagree because everything about the Sabbath, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-18, leads you to one door. And on the, that door is the name Jesus Christ. He is the door. The Sabbath is Christ. He is our Sabbath. Not of works. And so, as I close, one application I ask you, is Christ your Sabbath rest? Do you find you, your rest in Him alone? Are you resting in Him alone? Are you trusting in Him alone? Or are you resting upon your own works? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Do you rest your needs? What are your needs? Physically, spiritually, emotionally. What are your needs? Do you go to your Sabbath rest? Instead of fighting and complaining and striving and borrowing and this and that and the other thing, do you go to your Sabbath rest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and rest your all in Him and wait upon Him? For He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us the Lord Jesus Christ, our great rest, our Sabbath rest. And we pray that in Him, for each of us here today, we would find our portion of peace and rest. Whatever anyone is struggling over, uneasy about, anxious about, troubled by, disturbed, depressed, striving, bitter, whatever or whoever soul is stirred up by some pressure and is not at rest, oh, would you not give them that liberty? Would you not give them grace to walk through that door, which is Christ himself, and be at peace and rest in him? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.